So uh, turn in your chairs if you want to turn to the front. And open your Bibles to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. And uh, Joseph and John, thank you so much for your leading us today. And uh, for your testimony, John, we appreciate that. <clears throat> this morning we're continuing to look at the I Am statements in the Bible, mainly the New Testament. We started with the great I Am statement in the Exodus, uh, but then uh, we're working our way mainly through John. There will be some other ones, uh, but mainly through John, where Jesus um, identifies himself as the great I Am by making these I Am statements. And uh, today... In John chapter 10, if I can get this working, watch out. There we go. I am the gate. I am the gate. This may, this may be one of the least familiar ones of his statements. We're, we've, heard him, we've heard Jesus talk about I am the light and, uh, and of course, the great I am. And, uh, but uh, I am the gate. <clears throat> Several times I follow the Franklin Police Department on Twitter and uh, the guy who sends out the tweets for the police department is a friend of mine. And, and at least once a week he's been putting a tweet out to remind everybody when you go to bed at night to lock your cars. Because there are some people out there who just go around checking to see if cars are unlocked. And if your car is unlocked, well then they help themselves to whatever you might have inside of your car. And so they... They will rob you of whatever is in the car. And it gets scary sometimes when you find out that somebody had a gun in their car and left it unlocked, and now somebody out there uh, has a stolen gun. When Missy and I first got married, we lived uh, not far, well, just off of West End Avenue in this upstairs attic apartment. And I had an old truck, and uh, there wasn't anything of value in there. And, and, uh, and so I hardly ever locked it because my theory has always been if there's something you want in my truck, just go ahead and take it, but just don't break my window, you know, because that would cost more than anything. But I had a little collection, like some of you do, where if you got change, you just kind of put change in the cup holder, and after a while, it, 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 you know, becomes a few dollars. And so apparently somebody in the neighborhood knew that, and so about once a quarter, just enough time to, to, for that change to get up to be 2 or $3, I would go into my truck that morning, and it would all be gone, and my glove compartment would be emptied, and everything thrown on the floor. They never took my radio because it was just a cheap radio, but they just kind of took this change. And so, um, you know, two or three times a year, I would get into my truck in the morning and think, well, they've gone through my truck uh, again. And then the same thing kind of happened in Arkansas when I had that old brown Jeep that some of you remember. And it was a canvas top and it was old and there was nothing in there but this radio uh, and some big speakers that really didn't work that well, but it looked nice. And over the course of the three and a half years that I was in Arkansas living in the parsonage, eventually they took everything out of my Jeep, just kind of pee one piece at a time. And before you knew it, it was all gone except for the steering wheel. And, and you know, again, it wasn't a nice radio, but they took it uh, anyway. And then while we, were while we were preparing to move back from Arkansas, I had my garage door open one day, and I was down at the church. It was all on the same property. And before I knew it, these two guys come riding through the parking lot, on my bike and Zach's bike. And it was in my garage and I was in my truck and so I ran them off the road, they went to a ditch and I yelled at them and I got my bikes back. And then there was another time, uh, while we were here one Sunday night during our Thanksgiving dinner, one of the first Thanksgiving dinners that we had, while we were here enjoying a Thanksgiving dinner as a community, someone from the community was here with us and when they got home, somebody had broken into their house. And they called me, and, and I went over there and uh, was there really before the police got there because she'd called the police as well and, and walked through this house right after it had been broken into. Has anyone here ever had their house broken into? Yeah, it's kind of, it wasn't my house, but my trucks and the things like that. But it's kind of an eerie feeling when you walk into a house and you realize that somebody has been in your house. You feel kind of vulnerable. You feel kind of violated on one level or another. And so keep that idea of thieves and robbers in mind as we go through today's lessons. 
But another thing to keep in mind before we look at the text is the importance of shepherding in the Bible among the Jewish people. Shepherding was one of the, the livelihoods that the, that the Israelites had, and it was, it was uh, the livelihood of a blue-collar type family. You didn't become rich being a shepherd. Now, if you owned the sheep, you may have had some, um, some money, but if you were the shepherd watching the sheep, well, then you were, that was a low-income type job, and, 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 even, and by the time of Jesus' day, it was even looked down upon a little bit. And so the idea that God sent the angels to the shepherds to tell them about the birth of Jesus is significant because God was reaching out to the people on the margins of life from the very beginning. He didn't go into the, into the um, rich places to tell people that Christ has been born, but he went out into the fields where the shepherds were, knowing that the shepherds were the poor. The shepherds were the people who were looked down upon. And so shepherd was, being a shepherd was quite common, but it just wasn't a very lucrative thing. And, and you were considered kind of dirty and smelly if you were a shepherd. But yet Jesus, on, on different occasions, uses this occupation of being a shepherd as an illustration or as an object lesson uh, for us. And so keep that in mind as we look at this passage. Really, John chapter 10, if you put it into context, you've got to go back a little bit into chapter 9 and even back a little bit farther than that into what we talked about last week. Remember last week, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And, and <clears throat> he said that in a, he made that statement after he, was, um, after he healed a blind person. Remember that? He spit on the ground, made mud, put the mud on the guy's eyes, told him to walk across town to a pool and wash it off, and, if, and didn't tell him he would be healed, but the guy did that, and when he washed his face off and washed the mud off his eye, he could see. And then people started questioning, why can't he see? And so if you go back into chapter 9, beginning in verse 13, you see this conversation that the Pharisees start to have with this guy who had been healed. They're trying to figure out what had happened. They don't really believe because they don't want to believe that Jesus is who he says he is. And so they were trying to make excuses. And so in, in chapter 9, verse 13, the Bible says that they brought to the Pharisees this man who had been blind, but now he could see. And Jesus healed this guy on the Sabbath, which upset the Pharisees. And then at the end of verse 15, they're asking the man what happened. And he says at the end of verse 15, Jesus, or he, put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed it, and now I see. But then the Pharisees were saying that this guy can't be from God because he did this on the Sabbath day. And so in verse 17 of chapter 9, the Bible says, Finally, they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened, and the man replied, He is a prophet. Now that made them mad. Because they were trying to say that he wasn't a prophet. And now this guy was saying that he was indeed a prophet. And so the Jews were upset. And so they call in the guys, the blind guy's parents. Can you imagine this? This guy has been healed. And instead of accepting it as a miracle from God, they're trying to think of all types of reasons why it wasn't from God. So they call in the guy's parents. And in verse 20 of chapter 9, they said, we know he is your son. The par the, and the parents answered, and we know, he, we know he is our son, and we know he was born blind. But how he can see now or who opened his eyes, we don't know. If you read on, you'll see that they were afraid uh, to say anything positive about Jesus because word had already gotten around that if you spoke positively about Jesus, well, then you would be kicked out of the synagogue, which was a big deal. That was the community. That was the neighborhood. You would be ostracized, in other words, if you spoke positive about Jesus. And so they were asking the parents, what happened? And the parents said, well, he's our son. I'm telling you, he was born blind. But ask him what happened. He's of age. He can answer for himself. And then in verse 24 of chapter 9, a second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God, they said. We know this man is a sinner. They're talking about Jesus. They're trying to get him to deny what Jesus had done. We know he's a sinner. In verse 25, the blind man replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I do know. I was blind, but now I see. That didn't satisfy them. So this conversation keeps going 
um, back and forth. And, and finally, he says, to the blind man kind of gets fed up, and you can read that in the context. He just kind of gets fed up. But then in verse 35 of chapter 9, Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, the blind man, out of the synagogue. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? Do you believe me, basically? Who is he, sir, the man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. And Jesus answered, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. And then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. But notice the guy was healed before he even had faith in Jesus. And then he says, I believe. And then Jesus starts to talk about judgment. He talks about being spiritually blind. And so in verse 40, some, in chapter 9, verse 40, some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and they asked, what are we blind to? The Pharisees start to realize that Jesus is being judgmental. He's condemning them. Jesus said in verse 41, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. And then in chapter 10, verse 1. With that as the context, Jesus speaking to the Pharisees, he says, I tell you the truth. Literally, what that phrase means is amen and amen. Amen and amen. I tell you the truth. The man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. This sheep pen, if you can see the picture, this is an ancient sheep pen, a small one, but if you can see it, it's a stone wall, maybe six feet high or so, uh, sometimes they're in a circular shape, sometimes they're in a square shape, and depending on how many sheep you have would be how big the pen was. But there is just one way in and one way out. And the shepherd would lie in that open space. That's where he would sleep, at the gate, to keep anything from getting into the sheep. The only way anyone could get into the sheep would be if they climbed over the wall. The gate was small and skinny, and the shepherd was always there. And so he says that no one enters, if anybody enters the sheep pen besides through the gate, then they're a thief and a robber. The word thief implies subtlety or trickery and one who silently and secretly takes away, whereas a robber is one who steals by violence and bloodshed. So whether you do it quietly or violently, if you get to the sheep any other way besides going through the gate, you're a thief or a robber. Verse 2. The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of his sheep. The watchman opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice, the voice of the shepherd. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but they did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, I tell you the truth. I am the gate for the sheep. All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved, and he will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. So twice in that passage, Jesus says that he is the gate. There's some questions we need to ask before we apply this. Just some important questions to consider from this story. First, who is Jesus talking to? When he makes this analogy of him being the gate, who is he talking to? 
Well, chapter 9, verse 40, or in response to chapter 9, verse 40, we learn that he is talking to the Pharisees. So this whole thing is about the Pharisees and so the thieves and the robbers and all that. He is addressing this to the Pharisees who know that he is now criticizing them. And so you could say by more way of application then that Jesus is talking to religious leaders about religious leaders when he gives this story or this illustration. He's talking to religious leaders about religious leaders. And so that's who Jesus is talking to. But then what is Jesus talking about? in this story. Well, we've read it, and so what I'm going to tell you is nothing, nothing new that we didn't read, but basically uh, Jesus is talking about sheep and how shepherds lead and protect while thieves and robbers destroy. That's what he's talking about. He's talking to the Pharisees, and he's talking about how there's a shepherd who guards the gate, and then there are thieves and robbers who try to get to the sheep in some other way. So he's talking to religious leaders about religious leaders, and he's talking about how shepherds lead and protect and thieves rob and destroy. And so who is Jesus talking to? What is Jesus talking about? Third, who are the sheep? Well, I think you see that in context, the sheep are the people of God. The people of God. The Jews in particular, but now all of us who are trying to follow God, we're considered the sheep. Now, that's not a compliment because sheep are, are known for how unintelligent they are, how simple they are. But so we're the sheep. We're the sheep that he's talking about. And so if we're the sheep, then the question becomes, who are the shepherds? Now, in this passage, even though he kind of alludes to it, Jesus doesn't refer to himself as the shepherds, as the shepherd. Now, we'll look at it later on where Jesus says, I am the great shepherd. But that's not what he says here. And so Jesus really isn't talking about himself uh, precisely or exactly here. Sometimes he alludes to that, but he's not really talking about himself. And so who are the shepherds? Well, the shepherds are those who are leading the people of God to God. These shepherds have their own flock. These shepherds know their sheep personally. The sheep know the shepherd. They know the shepherd's voice. Listen, for some of you people, I have been your pastor for so long, you probably hear my voice in your head. You know. And it could be a crowded room and you would hear my, you would recognize my voice, even if I was, so I got to be careful what I say all the time because, you know, I don't know. <laughs> you know, one time somebody, um, they're not here, so I can tell this story. They haven't been here in a while, but they called me and they vowed and declared they heard me on the police radio arguing with the police. And that I was being pulled over for DUI and all that kind of, no, no, but that was your voice. No, 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 it wasn't, I promise, I promise. You know, but the shepherd knows his sheep, they know him, they hear his voice. The shepherd leads and protects and provides for the sheep. And so a modern day example should be obvious of this, that really Jesus is talking about religious leaders, but he's talking about pastors or church leaders or people who are responsible for a group of God's people. Those are the shepherds. And so then the question becomes, who are the thieves and the robbers? Well, in context, the thieves and the robbers are the Pharisees. They're the other religious leaders. An example of modern day thieves and robbers would be religious leaders who steal who kill and who destroy the people of God, and who buy $54 million planes, all in the name of God, and all the while by claiming to be God's messenger. Did you know that there are psychologists and psychiatrists 
who specialize in dealing with people who have been abused by church leaders. You know, just abused by the church. And not just sexually, but mentally and emotionally and physically. Just beat down and beat upon. And so these shepherds have killed and stolen and all of that. And so they're not really shepherds, they're thieves and they're robbers. And so then the question becomes, well, how can you tell the difference between shepherds and thieves and robbers? Well, the shepherd enters through the gate. Thieves and robbers enter by some other means besides the gate. And then comes the important question. Who is the gate? Well, Jesus is the gate. In fact, he said in verse 7 and verse 9, I am the gate. And so what Jesus is saying is that true shepherds lead their sheep through the gate. You see, by claiming to be the gate, Jesus was condemning all other religions and all other lifestyles and all other philosophies and all other belief systems that do not go through him. And so anyone who teaches a religion or a lifestyle or a philosophy or a belief system that does not go through Jesus is a thief or a robber. No matter what they may look like on the outside, no matter if they look like a shepherd, if they're not going through the gate, if they're not leading you to Jesus, well, then their true intentions are to steal and to kill and to destroy the souls of those who follow them. Because a true shepherd will lead his sheep through the gate. And who is the gate? The gate is Jesus. And as the gate... We have to go through Jesus to receive life. And so we go through him to receive, first of all, eternal life. John chapter 10, verse 9. Jesus says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. To be saved means to be brought back into a right relationship with God. It means to be made whole again. It means that you have eternal life. And Jesus says it is through him that you have it. Elsewhere, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. In Acts chapter 4, verses 8 through 12, you can read that later, but Peter is preaching, and he says in verse 12 that there is no other name given under heaven whereby you can be saved except the name of Jesus. Jesus is the only way to heaven. Jesus is the only way to forgiveness of sins. Jesus is the only way to be saved. He is the only way to eternal life. And a, she and a shepherd will tell you that. You have to go through the gate. You can't go over. You can't go around. You can't pay somebody else to do it for you. You have to go through the gate. Jesus is the gate. We have to go through him to receive eternal life. But we also have to go through him to receive encouragement in life. See, Jesus doesn't just save us and then leave us here to fend for ourselves. He is also here. And as we'll see later, he's the good shepherd. We're, you know, he's the good shepherd. And so he, and so he, he gives us encouragement. So how does Jesus encourage us? Well, he encourages us by, pro by protecting us. You see, nothing can get into the sheep pen without going through the gate. I mean, they can go over the top, but then they're going to be killed. If the shepherd's doing his job, they're going to be, he's, going to, you know, he's going to protect that. And so Jesus, so he protects us. They have to go through the gate. And now, now think about this. If Jesus is the gate and, and I'm a sheep, and so people have to go through the gate to get to me. What does that mean? That means they have to go through Jesus. 
to get to me. And that's encouraging, is it not? Nothing can get to me unless Jesus allows it to get to me. Now, if I'm living in disobedience to him and I'm not in the gate, well, then that's another thing. But if I'm under his protection, and if you go to Job, if you remember the story of Job and what happened, Satan had to go to God to ask permission to get to Job. Because Job was in obedience to God. And so there is protection. The psalmist put it this way in Psalm chapter 28. The Lord is my rock, my strength, my shield, a fortress of salvation for his anointed one. And so through all the turmoil and strife of life, I can find encouragement and hope because my trust and confidence are in Jesus Christ, the gate. John gave testimony to that when he gave us a test. In spite of all the stuff going on, I trust in him and him alone. And so I'll just ride this storm out. The gate. You can come to him and find encouragement and hope in this life because Jesus is our protector. But he also encourages us because he provides for us. He provides for us. The Bible tells us that my God will supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory. In Christ Jesus. Jesus knows my needs and he knows how to meet those needs better than I know how to meet those needs. Jesus is the gate. We go through him to receive. I may have told this story before, but here's here's how Jesus knows our needs before we know our needs. This is something very, very simple. But as I look out here, I see these white chairs and it was about this time last year that we purchased these chairs if you remember. And so I remember when I purchased the chair, we got them from Sam's, you know, no big secret. And they had to deliver them and they were going to call me when they got this many. And then I had to go to the Sam's in Bellevue for some reason to get them. And so I didn't know. I mean, I knew how many chairs I ordered, but I didn't know how much room those chairs would take up. I'd seen these chairs before. And so I thought, well, I'll just go rent a trailer from U-Haul. And so I go to, to U-Haul here in Franklin to get a trailer. Guess what? They don't have any trailers for rent. It's like a Wednesday. Where, where are all the trailers? No trailers. Are you kidding me? No trailers. Are, are you kidding me? They said, no, you have to go. I don't want to go to the other branch. I, and they said, well, I'll tell you. I, I said, you got a truck. I said, just give me the smallest truck that you have. And they said, well, Kevin, the only truck we have is those big ones. <laughs> like one of their bigger trucks. <laughs> that you all has. That's the only one we have. You can rent it. I said, I don't want that big truck. I want something small. I'm just picking up some chairs. Well, all we got is this big truck. But I tell you what, you're a good customer. We'll give you that big truck for what it would cost you to rent the trailer. So, okay. So now I'm driving this big truck. I get to Bellevue Sam's. I back up to the trailer. They open the trailer. And when, <laughs> when I saw the pallets that all these chairs were on, guess what? The only thing you all had that they would fit on was that truck. They wouldn't have fit on a trailer. And they wouldn't have fit on a small truck. That's the only thing they would have fit on. And I thought, okay, God, I get it. You know more than I do what it is that I need. Now, I don't know why he answered that prayer, and there's still war and turmoil and stuff like that going all over the world. But at that moment in time, Jesus taught me a lesson that I know what you need more than you know what you need. He provides for us. And so we look to Jesus as the gate to receive an eternal life, encouragement in life, and then third, to receive enjoyment in life. Look at John chapter 10, the very first, last part of verse 10. Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. The King James Version says abundant life. Everyone is looking for satisfaction, are they not? We have had, if you've watched the news this week, two celebrities commit suicide this week. And you ask, how in the world when they have everything that we think a person needs, but yet they're not satisfied? 
Mental illness is a big issue. But everyone wants something to live for. Everyone, everyone wants something to make their life count. But enjoyment only comes through Christ. Contentment only comes through Christ. Without Christ, there will always be longing and emptiness. You say, well, does that mean that if I follow Christ, I'll never have any problems? <laughs> no, 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 no. You may have more problems. But there's joy even in the midst of problems. There's contentment. It's abundant life. Just follow me around for a week and see everything I get myself into. And, you know, I never get bored. Abundant, not easy life, not wealthy life, but full, abundant enjoyment of life. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Jesus said, I am the gate. As the gate, we can walk through him and receive eternal life, encouragement in life, and enjoyment in life. But we got to take that step. We have to take that step of faith and step through the gate. Look how that gate, I mean, it's just a gate. There are more flashy gates you can walk through. There are bigger gates you can walk through. There are gates that are more enticing than this gate. But Jesus says, I am the gate, and you walk through it. You place your faith, your complete trust, your complete faith in him to provide for you and to protect you and to give you eternal life and enjoyment in life and everlasting life and all of that. Have you done that? If you have, are you still kind of like a sheep and you got to be drugged through the gate? <laughs> you know, you want to go out on your own. You want to separate from the flock. You want to do your own thing. But the shepherd keeps saying, no, 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 no. You got to come back. You got to come into the fold. You got to come through the gate. You got to keep your eyes on Christ. No matter what you're going through, you got to stay focused on Jesus. When I was younger as a pastor, people would come to me with all kinds of questions and I would try to answer them. Why is this happening? Why is this happening? Why, why is God allowing this? Why is, and, and, and I finally realized that I, I just can't make up answers. I don't know the why. But what I can say, no matter what you're going through, I know this. Jesus wants you to draw closer to him. That's it. He wants a relationship with you. He wants you to press into him, not away from him, but closer to him. The gate. I am the gate. Whoever walks through it will have eternal life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for your goodness and your grace. And Father, I pray that... Um, Right now, if anyone has not placed their faith in you, that they would do so today. They would walk through the gate. But Lord, as sheep, sometimes we tend to stray, we tend to wander, and we just need to come back. Not to, to get resaved, but just to come back. And just to come back into the fold. To come back into your love and your protection. So Lord, may we do that. May we follow you all the days of our life and may we hear your voice and may we obey, may we listen and may we follow that voice. Help us to put out all the other distractions and all the other competing voices and listen to your voice and your voice alone. And we'll give you the praise. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You're dismissed.